again, we turn to a local man, Frank Werity. Frank, his talk is on the aspects of life and times of Ellen Costello and her family in Clenard Street, Belbriggan, in September 1920, now a hundred years ago. So Frank Werity is a local historian and a member of Belbriggan and District Historical Society. He holds an MA in local history from Minute University. Frank, you're very welcome. Thanks, Thanks very much. Um, the last speaker uh, emphasised the complexities that are to be, is to be found in local history, and I would relate to everything Brendan said. I also find that nowadays um, a person researching something can be overburdened by the sheer volume of material. It, it's great to have material and lots of it, but sometimes uh, it's overwhelming. And the Bureau of Military History witness statements are a case in point. There are pages and pages and pages of material, sometimes conflicting. And uh, the historian has his, work, his or her work cut out, cut out to uh, make sense of it all. I uh, firstly would like to acknowledge the Society Chairman Brian Howley and the committee for asking me here today. It's a very special thing for somebody from Balbriggan, grew up in Durham Park, named after um, the late TD, and uh, for me to be here talking about a part of Balbriggan uh, is very special to me. I knew Robbie Costlow, who would be, he, only, he died in 2014, he would be uh, the more recent of the Costlows that I'm going to talk about. Um, his son Declan, I, I had dealings with his son Declan, and then uh, Karen Kelly and Siobhan Courtney, uh, they were uh, also closely connected to the Costlow family. Now, there's a number of Costlow families in Clonard Street. Uh, I'll be dealing with Ellen's side of the family presently, but there was a Philip Costlow who married a Mary Richardson in 1901, and then uh, I think it was uh, their sons, Michael, who married an Andrews uh, in 19, uh, beg your pardon, Philip and Mary uh, Richardson married in 1871, sorry. Um, Michael and, uh, forget the first name, uh, his wife was Andrews, they married in 1901, and then there was a known Costlow who married, married um, Elizabeth O'Shaughnessy in 1905. Now there's a great story behind those people, um, but it's not one that I can go into today. It requires more work. It's another story. One of the great, uh, one of the, the better known people from that family will be the Mary Coslow who was lost on the Lusitania in May 1915. And they have a headstone. There's a family headstone out in Balscadden, and uh, it um, provides information about that. If you are looking at it, you can, you can take it that um, her age is understated. Her age was given as it was in 1911. Somebody forgot to add on the four years up to 1915. So just bear that in mind. Uh, I must thank uh, Killian Harford here. Killian made inroads into the genealogy of this family, Ellen Costlow. He made inroads into the genealogy and he made that available to me. Uh, Jim Walsh also uh, was a great help to me and not only that, he introduced me to Karen Kelly, whose mother was Mary Kelly, nee Co or Mary Costlow, Mary Kelly Nee Costlow. Through Karen, I met Siobhan Courtney, whose mother was a, a, a Costlow from Clonarcy, who went, Rita who went to live in um, Julianstown. And um, from what um, Siobhan said, she only died two years ago. Rita only died in 2018. If I had got talking to her, she would have talked about Clonard Street for, well, you know, she loved to talk about Clonard Street. Um, by way of an introduction, uh, I'll just read out a short introduction. This presentation is primarily about the family of Ellen Costlow, whose parents were Robert and Mary Costlow, nee Morphy. 
who lived in Clonard Street before, during and after the sack of Balbriggan. A wide range of sources has been looked at during the research period, as well as having contact with Costello descendants still living in the area at the present time. Examples of the sources looked to for information would include contemporary newspapers, online genealogy websites such as Irish Genealogy and FindMyPast.ie, um, uh, of course census returns, and uh, the Bureau of Military Witness Statements uh, with the particular emphasis being on uh, John Gaynor. And as Brendan said, John identified himself in his witness statement, page 15, as being the man who pulled the trigger on Sergeant Finnerty. But of course, if you read the sources, the newspaper sources, there was more than one bullet fired. Whether they all came from John Finnerty's revolver, or whether others had pulled the trigger, we just will not be able to tell. Um, I, I have an image coming up, which I think is the house. Uh, one of the newspapers says that uh, Affinity was brought into Michael Costello's home. Now he's in the family that I'm not talking about today, but we will mention that. Um, I've already mentioned uh, the daughter of the late Rita Courtney and, uh, and um, Helen Kelly, or Karen Kelly, beg your pardon. Now, uh, just a little bit of genealogy. The late Rita Courtney had a handwritten family tree. In other words, there were three pages of a family tree. Where they began with a Thomas Costello and a Catherine Clark from County Cavan, who had a son, Robert, and another son, Philip Costello, who were brothers. I tried to verify that, and it's difficult, because on Robert's uh, census return, Robert was still alive, so he put down his place of origin as Cavan. Philip died in 1900. He was only 48. He didn't get to write his name down on the 1901 census, so we don't know his origins. But Rita Courtney is, or it seems to be happy that they are brothers but I would like to be able to document it by another source, if you know what I mean. Anyway, uh, the Robert Costello of interest here married Mary Morphy, uh, among whose children was their second-born daughter, is Ellen, the subject of this talk. That's her there. She's about 42 years of age there. Um, and then the Philip that Mary, married Mary Richardson, they had their own line of children, I think they had nine. Uh, it would be great, I would love to have been able to go into them. I did some work on it, but it's just not possible. I may be asked to do something another day, which I would be willing to do. Next slide, please. Now we'll start off by looking at a map of Clonard Street itself, 1906 but generated a little bit before that, it published in 1906. And if you watch the street there, there's uh, activity in 1920 going on all along that street. We know that uh, all the cottages, that were O'Neill's cottages that were born, and uh, there was Costello's house born, and Cochrane's house. I have a few images. We've already seen these images, but nevertheless, I have to use them again to put my story into context. Um, the Costellos that we're looking at are primarily inter interested are up this end of the street. They're in this area here. They're in that area there. Now, this is another image that we find readily online. I don't think it's in the... Oh, it may be in the calendar, the society's calendar. I just can't remember. Um, you will see I've drawn a line there. That is... Um, the area where Ellen Costello was, uh, cottage was destroyed. Um, and that picture was taken soon after the sack. So it's either the one immediately under the arrow, or there could be another one just to the left of it. In any case, uh, talking to, um, uh, we, can we also have context there in the sense that the second image shows the, uh, the row of more modern houses uh, 
across there. I used to pile around with an old Russell from there. That was on a long time ago. I don't even know where Donald is now. But in any case, the girls told me, that's uh, Karen Kelly and Siobhan Courtney, that the, uh, there was another house reached by an archway. Now, somebody might remember this archway. I went to school through that street every day on the way to the National School coming across the canal, but I don't. I wasn't old enough to be taking interest in things. Somebody might remember there was an archway that brought you into the, gar the rear garden there where there was another house. Okay. Now, we know from the, uh, the, the society's calendar that what you see there is Costlow's and O'Brien's house. Uh, and I've, I think I've already said, it may have been Costlow's house where Sarge Infinity was taken into. Uh, Dr. Fulham removed the bullet. Uh, from reading between the lines, the doctor saw no hope for the man because the bullet had gone through his here and had come through his liver and it had come out somewhere around the, the nipple here. It couldn't have come all the way out because if it had, the bullet would have been out on the road. The fact that the doctor was able to take the bullet out meant it was still inside. That's hard to believe. I thought a bullet would always go straight through. In the hours after the shooting dead of Head Constable Peter Bork and the wounding, wounding of his RIC Constable Brother William, the Black and Tans from Gormsham Camp entered the town and ransacked much of it by morning time and where James Lawless and John Gibbons lay dead. When they came to Clonard Street, colloquially known as Sinn Féin Alley, Jim Walsh has already mentioned that, there were a number of accounts published in newspapers far and wide. A report in the Irish Independent on Friday 24th of September 1920 provided a personal account by John Hoyne and he goes into, uh, I, I won't be able to read it all here, it's just a few lines. He basically said he was an experienced reporter. He thought he had seen it all. He had seen a number of inquests. He'd been at a number of inquests that very week in various places. He, he was a hardened individual. Uh, he starts his, uh, his report then by saying, a tiny infant's cot, torn, twisted, mangled, flung in the gutter, a mass of shapeless wreckage. This was the sight that gripped me most amidst all the horror of Balbriggan yesterday afternoon up in the blue and cloudless sky. It's well worth following that up. It's in the Irish Independent. Uh, I don't have time to go any further into it. There's another one, another short account. Ellen Coslow, or any of the Coslow family, didn't leave me any written uh, account of their experiences. And I'm sure lots of us in this room will have had people who were living in Balbriggan. I had, we all, most of us had, I wish I could have gone back and asked them, you know, what their memories were. Even if I was only 15 years old, I could have wrote something down, but didn't do it, I'm afraid. Um, the Drawed Independent gives us an account, and as Brendan points out, it's a treasure trove. I did a story in Minute, uh, I did my BA in Minute on the Belgium refugees coming to Ireland, and Professor R.V. Comerford said to me, when I proposed it, he said, you can't do that story. A PhD, a doctorate, has already done it. I said, I see in her work, she didn't mention, she didn't look at the Drawed Independent. It's a source that wasn't used. That's what I'm going to use. And it covers different material. And it, I won't be using any of her material. Right, okay, that's grand. And he was supervising me, the head of the history department. So I, I, I fully value the Drawed Independent. It's a wonderful source. It's like somebody keeping a, a, a diary. Anyway, uh, the Drawed Independent on Saturday the 25th September 1920, it contained a story by a man using a nom de plume uh, who wrote that, when I reached Balbriggan on Wednesday morning, Clonard Street had suffered most. 25 houses haven't been born in the area and many of them totally wrecked. Though it was after 10 o'clock, the town seemed derelict. In Clonard Street, I met a few people, women and children, coming in from the country where they had spent the last two nights. 
coming back to see their ruined homes, perhaps, or to thank Providence that they, had, they still had a roof to cover them. At the door of a partially wrecked cottage, I saw a man in the short sleeves, without a coat or waistcoat, unkempt and with black rings around his eyes, showing plainly that he had not slept for two nights. I questioned him and he said, Yes, I escaped. I heard them breaking into the houses lower down and I fled the way I am to my son-in-law's across the street. He had escaped death, perhaps worse, but he had nothing left. His home was born to the ground and he hadn't even the coat for his back. It is pitiful. Uh, now, it's a shame the reporter didn't record the man's name. We could follow that up. He would have descendants, presumably. But we, he, didn't, he didn't mention he used a, a non de plume himself, so we don't even know who he is. But this one here is uh, Cochrane's house, and Jim might be able to say whether Willie Cochrane was living there. Presumably he was, if it was Cochrane's house. Yeah, Jim said he was. Next one, please. Now, um, um, prior to his marriage, Robert Costlow was living in Balbriggan when he attended the Petty Sessions Court in September 1861 for an alleged assault on a man at Skerries in that August. In the in year following his marriage, uh, I'll be dealing with his marriage in a second, it was 1869. In the year following his marriage in 1869, Robert was mentioned in Slater's Commercial Dic uh, Directory uh, 1870, as having a marine store at his home at Clarnard Street, and uh, now he, he would have put that in there himself. And uh, if you look at Slater's uh, uh, again in 1881, and presumably in the years in between, I just jumped a few years, he's, uh, he's mentioned in there as having a business behind his house. Now, his marriage certificate. Um, tells us that he was from a uh, cabin. It says that uh, he was 20, 28 years of age. It's a bit squiggly, but I think it's 28. Uh, Mary Morphy, his wife-to-be, was 22. And both, he was a bachelor, she was a spinster. And uh, he was described as a peddler. And that would be an older term for a dealer. Peddler... Um, People wouldn't use that expression now, don't think. Um, he had a dealer's license and bought rags, bones, scrap metal, and other things uh, from the, uh, the poor law unions in the county and city of Dublin. And um, find my past daughter, he will give you examples of that readily enough. Tells you what he paid for them. Uh, by the weight, by the pound, or by the hundred weight, whatever. Uh, underneath that, the, uh, the, the, uh, the marriage certificate is um, the birth certificate for Ellen. She was born on the 5th of April at Balbriggan. Robert was her father. Mary Costello and Morphy was her mo mother, and he, he was a marine dealer. Uh, both Robert and Mary made their marks on the document. The 1911 census, Robert was aged 56 years, Mary was 50. He was a dealer in pigs. Uh, number 56, house number 56 was privately built, third class dwelling with mud walls, two rooms, two windows to the front, and the neighbours were Gossons, Morphys, Hammonds and Hughes. Uh, Ellen is not found on the census, and neither could I find her on any other census in Ireland. I don't know where she was, uh, but she doesn't come up on the census return. Um, she does, however, come up on a Balbriggan Petty Sessions Court in 1906 and 1908 as a witness, in one case for her father, and uh, th those uh, sources are readily found. Um, I should have said that that previous one was the, no, the 1901 census that I was looking at. I beg your pardon. The 1911 census, um, we have Robert was a marine dealer. Um, of the eight children that he and Mary had born alive, six were still living at census time. 
and they were living in a second class house so they were in a much improved situation house wise a stone built slated roof five windows in front four rooms in the house six out offices that had a stable two piggeries one feral house, one shed and one store. And in 1907, uh, Robert had eight cattle, and we know that because he had allowed them to wander on the road and he ended up in the Petty Sessions Court because of that. These are the children of uh, Mary, Robert and Mary. Uh, Mary Theresa was the firstborn, 7th of November 1869, baptised at Balbriggan, godparents S. Dunn and Rebecca Tyrrell, Ellen Costello born in Balbriggan, 5th of April, 1871, baptised by Brigham, on 9th of April, godparents Philip Costlow and Catherine Clark. Now that Philip Costlow, uh, to me, looks like the Philip that I mentioned earlier, who subsequently died in 1900. Uh, and that would be um, evidence that uh, the, there was a relationship there, but whether they were actually brothers or not, I'm not sure. Thomas was next. Uh, he was born in 1872. Um, he lost his life in the British Army at Barakpur, India, on 18th of October 1901. He was aged 24 years. The next was Robert, born in Balbriggan, 10th September 1874, baptised in Balbriggan. Bridget was next, born in Balbriggan, 22nd of April 1883. Richard, born in Balbriggan, 17th of August 1885. And Philip Joseph, Born May 1888 uh, at Balbriggan. We have a, a, a photograph there uh, just before that. The, the, the photograph there was um, of the eldest child, Mary Theresa, and a good looking woman she is too, dressed in the period style of the time. Now we have a picture of the house. Uh, this is the house that you got access through through the courtyard. Uh, it's a fine dwelling. Uh, as it said in the census returns, slated roof. That's Ellen out front, standing out front. We don't know who the children are. Um, uh, um, I just have written here, Ellen standing outside the Coslow home at number 37 Clanard Street, Balbriggan. Ellen's brother Joseph Coslow and his wife Catherine Kitty Nee Towser, in more recent times, um, lived in that house. Next one, please. Uh, Thomas Coslow, British Army soldier, died Barak Power, India, as I've already said, in 1901. Um, very difficult to find information on him. Uh, the, the, the information there with the arrow there just shows uh, that's a, a sort of a list of... Uh, of, the, of, peop, of army personnel who died in, in, in India, or that part of India, is near Calcutta, apparently, Barakpur, uh, and a very fine a photograph of Thomas there, which came through the family sources. This is another uh, sibling of Ellen's. Uh, this is Bridget. A uh, couple of photographs there of Bridget. Bridget uh, went to live at Plymouth, and uh, we have a census return there in the centre there, which tells us that she was uh, married to an Edward uh, Shepherd, who owned a tea refreshment, tea refreshment rooms in Plymouth. Um, there was a Margaret Coslo staying with her, who was described as a visitor, but in actual fact uh, is also down as a laundress. Now Margaret, the name Margaret doesn't, is not one of Ellen's sisters, so it may come from the Philip line. I just I meant to check that out. Helen's Coslow's father, Robert, died on 15th of April 1918, uh, while her mother, Mary, passed away on the 6th of January 1919. In Robert's case, his age was inscribed on the Coslow headstone at Balscadden Cemetery as 86 years. However, his death certificate was later corrected to 72 years, a difference of 14 years. Uh, the registrar must have made the error in the first place and then uh, presumably that was Dr. Fulham and corrected it then at some later stage but in the meantime it got chiselled onto the headstone out in um, Balscadden so you need to be aware of that. Uh, Robert's will, Robert 
cost low of Clonard Street, Valbriggan, County Dublin, Marine Dealer. Um, his will was granted on 19th of July 1918, and uh, Ellen Costlow Spinster was their primary um, beneficiary. And the debt search then there, uh, both for her father and her mother. And you can see, uh, yes, it's, if, you, if you may not be able to see it on their screen there, but his age is down as 86 years. And then over in the margin, there's a, a circle which was put in later which more or less tells you that there was an error and it should be revised to 72 years. Uh, her mother, when she died, was 61 years. She was described as the widow of a dealer. This is the image that we have in the society's calendar, and which um, I was asked to do a bit of work on. I've numbered them. The numbers are put there by me, but just so that I can um, keep track of them. Ellen Costlow might have lived at this house in Clannard Street while Brigham in September 1920. I say might have, might have because we were already seen they were living in a much better house. They appear to have this poorer quality house earlier in the 1901 census. So whether they continue to, ha uh, to have it, they must have, because, uh, well I can't be sure, I can't be sure. Um, because when you come to look at 19, there's a difference between the 1901 census and the 1911 for Balbriggan. It's a nightmare. Something went wrong with the numbering of the houses. You can't follow the numbering of the houses. They're completely different. And the enumerator, uh, Constable Keelty, wrote a, a note to the effect that uh, he's looking, he's taking the town of Balbriggan en globo as a whole, I take that to mean because the, the, the streets are not broken into wards and the houses are not numbered. So it's completely, uh, very difficult. You have to look at what the, uh, the, the fabric of the house was made from to be able to sort of say if people are still in the same house. Now this is a marriage, uh, we're moving a, a little bit further ahead. This is a marriage of uh, Philip Joseph Coslow of Clannard Street, Balbriggan, and Kathleen Towser of Calester, County Dublin. And they married at Coolock uh, Catholic Church on 30 June 1926. Um, he was a bachelor, she was a spinster, no age given. He was a labourer of Clonard Street, Balbriggan. Uh, Robert Costello was his father. She was, um, her father was Edward Towser, or Towser, a chef. Now we have some images now that came through the family line. Uh, We'll move quickly through them. That's a group photograph uh, for uh, the aforesaid Joseph and um, Kathleen. And uh, they make a fine couple. Two photographs basically on their wedding day, I would imagine. That's the couple themselves. The, the picture is not great quality, but that's Joseph and uh, Kathleen, known as Kitty. The child is unnamed. And then Joseph himself, with two Im images of him there, uh, in his older years. One of them there is a picture of Ellen in our garden. You can see she's beginning, she's getting uh, older. That's probably the last photograph that's ever taken of Ellen Coslow, I would imagine. And then uh, uh, an earlier image of her uh, taken, in, uh, ta taken with a child. Um, the one in the garden it says here, was uh, taken in 1939. So she died in 1943, so she is getting uh, towards the end of her life. This is the headstone in the new cemetery. Now, the Durgan brothers, I'll be talking about them a little later. Just to begin with, uh, their name is spelled differently than it is there. Instead of an I, there's an E. Now, it's a bit uh, of a puzzle how these Durgans, uh ended up living with uh, Ellen. There's no answer to it, I'm afraid. Um, they had, uh, they were Dublin. They, um, the mother died. In 1901, they were in uh, uh, Summer, Summer Hill, North Dublin. Father was a labourer. Uh, the mother died in 1912. Even though there's a newspaper when one of the Dunigans, uh, uh, there's a newspaper said that his mother was at the grave, but 
I don't know how that can be. The mother died in 1912, had an accident. Then the father died uh, soon after, also from an accident. In any case, the boys, uh, the boys were orphans, and uh, they came and were living with uh, Ellen Costello. Ellen referred to, to them as nephews. Uh, and uh, when she w w went to buy a mare in Drogheda, uh, and it, the mare didn't turn out to be uh, what she had hoped, uh, the horse wasn't suitable for the work, it was, she had brought one of the Dunnigans with her, and she referred to him when it ended up in court, she referred to that his, her nephew had gone along with her. But you would think he'd be able to find some link. Uh, one of her siblings perhaps married uh, a Dunnigan man, but I couldn't find anything like that. The deaths of the Durdigan brothers. Uh, the mother Annie died on the 9th of February 1912, and the father Thomas died on the 5th of March 1960 in a Jervis Street hospital. He was a dock labourer at that stage, and he had an accident from a fall. Now, uh, Karen Kelly and Siobhan Courtney remembered in the back of their minds that he had been kicked by a horse, and that was what killed him. So, it just shows you, he had a fall, it didn't, it, it didn't say anything about a horse, but perhaps he fell off a horse and the horse kicked him when he was on the ground, we just don't know. 1911 census for the Durgan brothers. They were living at number one Moors Cottage, uh, North Dock in Dublin. Um, the two boys are, Patrick was age four and Thomas Durgan was age one. And the father, Thomas, was a dock labourer, age 35. And now we move on to uh, the fair Hammond. Uh, the fair Hammond, uh, I wasn't able to get an early photograph of him, but through the courtesy of Joe Cortes and his wife, Margaret, who was a Hammond, and the fair was her uncle. Uh, only as recent as yesterday, I was getting some material which I was frantically trying to get into uh, PowerPoints in time, thinking that I had until tomorrow. But in any case, uh, just a bit of information of the census return. Uh, Fred the Fair Hammond's parents were Margaret Hammond, Nee Matthews, and John Hammond. And they lived in Clonard Street. Uh, they, would be, they were neighbours of Ellen Coslow's. And Fred was, is not on that census because he wasn't born until August of 1911. These two images here came from Joe Cortes and I just think they're great. I, I couldn't believe I was looking at a, a picture. I, I don't know, uh, Jim, have you seen that, that picture before? Yeah? Right. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> it's hard to keep. It's hard. You, you're, uh, you, you've seen everything, but I've never seen it before. Um, uh, the man, he, uh, uh, the fair's father, John, He's the man at the end there wearing, um, he was a ganger, so he's wearing a sort of a walking man's hat outside Balbriggan uh, Railway Station in 1914. And then the, the woman there, uh, the details about her, that was Julia Hammond, the fair's wife. Uh, they married in 1936. She was from Lusk. She was a Lynch, Julia Lynch. Uh, but she was known locally here as Una. And uh, that photograph was taken at the Loreto Convent in 1976, where a presentation was being held for pioneers in the town. The birth certificate for the fair is um, the 23rd of August, 1911. That's when he was born. The marriage certificate is there lower down. The marriage took place on the 2nd of December 1936. Frederick Hammond, bachelor, trimmer, Julia Lynch, age 20, spinster, from Lusk. Um, I asked Joe about the trimmer and he said yes, he worked in Smith and Company for a while, then he went to the fishing boats and eventually ended up skippering the boat out of Balbriggan Harbour. This is uh, Ellen Costello's house as it is today. Remarkably, it's still there. Lots of places in Glenard Street have, have been obliterated. But this particular house, um, 
the lesser of the two dwellings, I'm presuming the other one is gone because Rory McKenna and myself went down there to look and uh, I didn't see any second house in, in through an archway and that, there's no archway there now. But that house now is a butcher shop and uh, it's just remarkable to see it. Now if you, ref if you find yourself down there and you have the society's calendar with you and bring up not that image but the older image and stand here to this side and as if you were in that building when there was no roof and you'll see the chimneys of those newer houses where Russell's among many others live you'll see the chimneys you'll see the same chimneys that you can see in the older picture because those houses are, are unchanged they're still there this is an, another Joe Cortis um, photographs the Fingal Lowell IRA marching through Clarnard Street in the 1940s unfortunately I can't name any of them I didn't really try to but uh, I, I'm not able to name any of them now uh, this image is uh, 1937, Balbriggan, or um, Clonard Street in 1937. Now, Ellen, Ellen Costler was still alive in 1937, and she must have been amazed with uh, the, the houses being built there uh, in the memory of uh, Dr. Fulham. And when you look at that map, and you, you, you see the amount of land that each house has, in well, semi-detached, albeit, the amount of land that they have in comparison to uh, any other houses on, the, on that street is just remarkable, the amount of land. So that, that shows a dramatic uh, difference in uh, Clarnard Street in 1937. Now Rory and myself walked uh, Clarnard Street in August last. Rory had a camera and we took a few photographs. He knows more about what he was photographing than I do, but anyway, um, the site there, uh, the, the, the stream of water that used to feed the tan, the tan yard and go on down to Gallant's Mills runs parallel with them trees apparently, according to Rory. And uh, a house, uh, somebody else told me that Oney Castle, the man that used to be known as Oney Castle, clearly his name was Owen, uh, lived in three cottages that were there. The next one then is, um, is where we're trying to uh, see what is there now of Cochrane's, O'Brien's and Costlow's houses. But I really don't want to try and say which is which because the big distinguishing feature of them was the big window, open window, and now it, that, that's been altered. So suffice to say that Rory took the picture of those, so they're, uh, they're certainly in, in the frame as being the ones that were destroyed in 19... Uh, next picture please. Um, this picture here shows Rita Costlow. Now Rita was Catherine Costlow who later ma married Lou um, Courtney and then they went down to live in um, Unionstown. Uh, the picture uh, is 1943-1944 uh, Balbriggan Girls School. Rita is middle row second in with the bow in her hair on the left hand side uh, we can make that out there can you make that out may yes, I can see yeah the girl with the bow in her hair in the middle row over there that's Rita courtney and yeah and that picture was sent to her uh, at her address which was uh, 37 by uh, clonard street by Brigham. that was in 1943 1944 uh, this one here is um, uh, Catherine Kitty Coslow, Catherine Joseph and Catherine's Kitty Coslow's daughter Mary on a Holy Communion day and then Kitty again in London I hard to make out the date but I think it says 1953 anyway the images were the images were of course here Karen Kelly and uh, Karen Kelly gave me those images next one please uh, Robbie Coslow and sisters. Now, um, Rita is this girl over here. Uh, her sister, uh, Mary, is a... Uh, Rob, Robbie was an only child. Eventually went to live in Rush. I knew him because he used to go to my, come call to my mother-in-law's house in Rush selling vegetables. He was, we worked for Irish Lights all his life, but he then took on to sell vegetables in later time. And um, 
he was able to tell me uh, my grandfather Peter where he died seven years before me and he had no pic, no photograph Robbie was able to tell me what he looked like he said if you look at your uncle Tom you're seeing the exact same the next one is Robbie Coslow and Maureen Coslow and E. Kelly on their wedding day 12th of February 1957 and then Ma Robbie and Maureen Costello and uh, Pardick and Mary Kelly and Billy and Eileen Sweetman, Jackie and Francis Kelly. Uh, my wife is connected into the Kelly family of Lusk through the Brogans of the Commons Lusk. Next one, please. Uh, Joe sent me this one. That's Robbie Costello again with a Mr. Doherty uh, in Bridge Street in 1998. Uh, just a few headstones in the um, these are the, the one on the, the far one there is a Costlow grave in the new cemetery, St. Peter and Paul Cemetery here in Balbriggan. And this one over here is in Whitestown uh, in Rush. Uh, that's um, Maureen and uh, Bobby, or Robbie Costlow's grave. And then finally, the next one, um, if you're in Balscadden Cemetery, you go in the gates, just inside the gates, most people know, is a, huge, a big headstone to the Philip, the family of Philip and Mary Richardson. And it tells you there that the daughter Mary was lost in this Lusitania. They also lost uh, two sons. Um, I think they were in the army. But then if you carry on down the uh, cemetery, down to the far end, you will come across, uh, this is Robert and Mary Morphy's grave. And there's uh, quite an amount of information as that, uh, uh, on that. Just be aware that when it says Robert was 86, he's nowhere near 86. He's only 72, which, is, which if you follow the genealogy site, you will realise somebody made an error. But an error of 14 years is a little bit much. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I just, uh, the society, I, I thank... Uh, Brian and the society for having me here. It just, it means something special to me. And I hope you got something out. Uh, a family that lived in Hernard Street, right through the sack, before and after. I just wish I could have written, uh, uh, spoken to Rita, uh, uh, Rita uh, Courtney, because, I mean, she was alive up to two years ago. How close is that? Thank you very much.